All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you. You're a good, a holy, an awesome, and a gracious God. And I pray, as always, that this message is a message that you, God, have for your people. May the proud amongst us be humbled and the humble lifted up, Father. In the blessed name of Jesus, amen. Please open up your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. This is the second Sunday, uh, excuse, yeah, second Sun. that's right, second Sunday in Advent. Advent is the season of the church here where we look back to the coming of, the first coming of Jesus and all the benefits that we received because of his first coming. And we look forward to the second coming of Jesus Christ when we will receive that final consummation of the ages and eternal glory will be our home forever. Sorry, my sermon was down here. I lost it for a second there. No, it's all good. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 9. And we've been doing sermons based on the Advent devotional that's back there. If you, in the narthex, if you haven't gotten it yet, please do. So the verses that we're going to go through on Sundays and Wednesdays come from the Advent devotional. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning at verse 1. Say amen if you're there. Hallelujah, if you need more time. I'm, <laughs> I must go on boasting. Though there is nothing to be gained by it, I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. On behalf of this man I will boast, but on my own behalf I will not boast, except of my weaknesses. Though if I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I would be speaking the truth, but I refrain from it, so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong." The Apostle Paul was used mightily by Jesus Christ. Uh, when I came back to Jesus, it was the Pauline epistles that I absolutely gobbled up and loved. He wrote, depending on if you believe that Paul wrote Hebrews, uh, I kind of do, so that would be 14, but at least 13, 14 of the 27 New Testament books. That means of the books of the New Testament, one man, the Apostle Paul, wrote half, half of the books. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? God used him to heal the sick. God used him to raise the dead. He went to three, possibly four missionary journeys and spread the gospel all throughout the Mediterranean. He really is an amazing man and God did amazing things. It was to the Apostle Paul that in the Bible, Jesus appeared on the road to Damascus and appointed him to be the apostle to the Gentiles. Then, according to this text, Paul was brought up to the third heaven. Now, I want to be real clear about the third heaven. People write a bunch of stuff about this. I think it's very easy. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 30, it says that God gave man dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the heavens. Well, birds aren't flying in heavenly glory. Then the Psalm talks about the heavenly bodies. Second Peter, actually, just that we read, the heavenly bodies will burn. Well, that's the stars, the sun, the moon, that's the universe. The third heaven is simply the dwelling place of Almighty God. And Paul doesn't know whether in the body or not, but he was brought up to the third heaven, and he got to see heavenly glory, and he was returned. That is an amazing privilege that nobody else has been given. 
And he says, I saw things that no human being are able to utter. Now, with everything that God did through the Apostle Paul, because the Apostle Paul is still a sinner, there's an inherent danger. What's the inherent danger that a man might have, might feel, might think, if you're casting out demons, you're raising the dead, you're healing in the name of Jesus, you see the risen Lord Jesus Christ, he comes down from heaven just to appear to you, and then he also brings you up to heavenly glory. What might be the danger? Pride. You might be tempted to think yourself a little bit more special than everybody else. That might be the danger. So the Apostle Paul talks about how God prevented pride. See, pride is the worst of all sins. You know, I'm not going to talk about how the sins of our culture are small. What we see in our culture, we see sexual immorality. We see greed. We see debauchery. We see faction and envy and strife. We see marriages dissolving. We see children living in really parentless homes. We see all the commandments of God being violated. Some of the, the violation is celebrated in our culture. But do you know that in comparison to all of that, all of those things are flea bites in comparison to pride. The elevation of self above other people is what made the devil the devil is what caused Eve to sin and his spiritual cancer. The idea that I am more important, more valuable, or the ship couldn't sail without me. That is the biggest spiritual cancer. And you know what? Have you ever noticed? You, we rarely hear sermons on pride. And yet it is the most spiritually dangerous thing in the world. C.S. Lewis on pride wrote this. Pride gets no pleasure out of having something. Only out of having more of it than the next man. We say that people are proud of being rich or clever or good looking. But they're not. They are proud of being richer or clever or better looking than others. If someone else becomes equally rich or clever or good looking. There would be nothing to be proud about. It is the comparison that makes you proud. The pleasure of being above the rest. Pride, <laughs> pride is not wanting to sleep with beautiful women. That's something else. I mean, there's pride there, but that's not what we're talking about. It's the guy who wants to steal your wife just to show that he is better than you. That's the diabolical kind of pride. You know, I talked to a woman years ago. She's not a member of our church. Don't look around and go, I wonder if he's talking about... No, not a member, all right? But I talked to a woman years ago, and she was uh, upset about some of the circumstances in her life, uh, in particular financial. And I said, hey, we, we really don't need to worry. We're going to have a mansion in heaven. And then she said to me, she said, it won't matter that we have a mansion in heaven because everybody's going to have a mansion in heaven. Now, she said that out loud. That's the kind of thing people think inside, but don't say out loud. But she said it out loud without recognizing how prideful that really is. In a sense, I want to feel special. Therefore, I want God to give me the stuff here to make it known to me that I am in some way, shape, or form more special or valuable than everybody else. So I've always said, you are unique. You are valuable. There is, you are one of a kind. God loves you individually, just like everybody else. You are just as special, just as unique, just as loved as everybody else. Jesus Christ died for you, just like he died for everybody else. Pride is the elevation of self above other people. So, because the Apostle Paul was terribly in danger of pride, visions of heaven, healing the sick, being used to write half the books of the New Testament, so the Apostle Paul writes what happened. 
Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelation. This is the New American Standard because I think it's plainer. For this reason, to keep me from exalting myself. So he knows why this happened. To keep me from thinking that I'm special. There was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan. And then what's the infinitive there? What does he say this messenger of Satan is going to do to him or is doing to him? To torment me. This is not a small thing. This isn't a moderate harassing kind of thing. Paul says, in order to keep me from exalting myself, God gave me a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. What does it mean to implore God? What does that mean? I begged him that it might leave me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. My grace is sufficient for you. What, what he was basically saying was, Paul, I never want it to get twisted in your mind. You're finding great success not because you're anything, but because I am. And the danger here is that you'll begin to think that you are more special than everybody else. So because I love you, and here's the thing, it really is love, because God can't deal with people in pride. He can't. He won't. So in order to keep you humble so that I can save you, so that you will remain right with me, I give a messenger of Satan, this thorn in the flesh. Many theologians wonder, what could the thorn in the flesh be? They talk about a physical illness. They talk about this, that, or the other thing. We don't know, but I'm going to take the text as plain. He says, a messenger of Satan. That's the Greek word, angelos. A demon came to torment him. Not internally, he's not possessed. A messenger of Satan tormented him wherever he went. Three times I begged God, get rid of this. And God said, no, I will not. I need you to know that my grace is sufficient for you. You know, it's... uh, <laughs> serendipitous, it's providential that I'm preaching this sermon right now because I have what would be uh, compared to this a trivial irritation in my foot and yet every single step hurts like a lot okay, every step hurts a lot so on the weekend that I was the busiest a funeral Friday morning caroling Friday night I have to go give a speech on Saturday morning in Annapolis and walk blocks to where I'm giving it, stand the whole time, and then the party Saturday afternoon. And then last night, I really wanted to go to the Kris Kringle thing, see the fireworks, so I went there and walked around there. I woke up this morning, and it was literally like someone was taking an anvil to my big toe. And I thought to myself, oh my goodness, I got to stand all day. I got to stand all day. And I really do think it's providential because this is my my point to bring this up. It's nothing, nothing in comparison. And it makes me think, my goodness, this dude is so amazing. Because I can't even, my point is, I'll be able to go home. I'll be able to put my foot up, put a bunch of ice on it, I got kids. Bring me some to drink. <laughs> Give me some ice. I need some ice. I'll be able to do that, and I know I'll be able to do that. And by the way, you have no idea the temptation it was to shorten this sermon, okay? <laughs> I'll be able to do that. I'll be able to go home, and then I'll be able to get some relief. Uh, he did it, man. Can you even fathom that scenario? He didn't get relief. And he begged, and God said, no, I cannot do it. My grace is sufficient. My grace is all you need. And I need you to know, Paul, because I'm doing such great things from, through you. I need you to know that this is about me, not you. So in order to make that plain, this has to happen. It puts everything in perspective in our lives, doesn't it? It's as if God were saying, Paul, I've answered many a prayer for you. You know, uh, 
in The Chosen, this is not written in the Bible. The Chosen is a television series about Jesus, if you don't know. There's actually a real movie. I cried. I happen to like the first three seasons of The Chosen. I always say the first three seasons because you never know what's going to happen in season four if they're going to go off the rails. You know what I mean? So I don't want to uh, advocate for something. But the first three seasons I've liked, it's not perfect, but I think it's really good. But they add a lot of stuff to make it enjoyable, all right? One of the things that they add is that James, not Peter, James, and John, not James, not John's brother, but James, uh, the other James who was an apostle, has an, uh, like a limp. He has a limp. That's nowhere in the Bible. That is uh, creative license. But in there, James has a conversation with Jesus. And it's a great conversation. Because James, he's humble, but he's like, Jesus, I'm walking around, you're using me to heal people, and I'm limping like an idiot, and it takes me so long just to walk a mile, and I'm in pain all the time. And Jesus is like, isn't that an amazing thing? He says, you're right, I could heal you in a second. But imagine you healing people with the limp that you have and you still love me even though you haven't been healed. It's an amazing moment. And I think to myself, it's the kind of thing Jesus might do just to kind of showcase. Does that make sense? It's the kind of thing. Now, it sounds rough. It sounds harsh, but it's not. God knows that the only way to salvation and heavenly glory is through him. So if pride is going to creep up out of love, what must he do? He must humble. And there's no better way to humble somebody than to bring pain. Seriously, there, there isn't. Right now, what it is, if you don't know what gout is, it's like arthritis in my big toe and the uric acid is crystallized. You have no idea how much you use your big toe until you can't use your big toe, man. It's the same thing, right? Just a small, this is what I'm trying to say. It's just a pinprick. That's all it is. It's just a pinprick. Absolutely lays me out. It, it makes me remember how shockingly dependent I am on everything on God. It's shocking. I can't be the man I want to be. I can't be the pastor I want to be. I can't be the husband I want to be. I can't be the father I want to be. I can't be nothing that I want to be. And all it is is a little pinprick. That's humbling, guys. It really is. It's humbling. What all you resort to is God help me. Or God, in this sermon, please don't let this be my thorn in the flesh, man. <laughs> please. Uh, all of a sudden, that you see it, don't you? So God brings this because, and I'll tell you why, it's an act of love. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. There is no more frightening verse in all the Bible. There's no more frightening verse than all the Bible. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. We worship the God who said, let there be light and there was light. We worship the God that separated the light from darkness. We worship the God who separated the water above from the water below. We worship the God who drew forth dry land out of seas. We worship the God that made vegetation uh, and plants. We worship the God who made the sun, the moon, the stars, and the cosmos. We worship the God who made the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea. We worship the God who created everything, and everything is in his hands. We are nothing in comparison to him. Can you imagine our self-elevation? God doesn't just ignore. What does it say? He opposes. I get chills. Look, I got goosebumps just thinking about that reality. To be opposed by him. I can't even think about it. So Lord, yes, make me humble so that I can see me as I really am, so that I can see that my life is all about you and not about me. Yes, Lord, please, because it's for my good. It's for my salvation. Let it be. C.S. Lewis, in a succinct way, tells us why pride is so dangerous. A proud man is always looking down on things and people. And of course, as long as you are looking down, you cannot see something that is above you. 
So in order to prevent this self-love, in order to prevent grandstanding, in order to prevent the self-aggrandizing spiritual nature in Paul, God gave a messenger of Satan to torment him, to keep him humble with this simple message, my grace is sufficient for you. I have many weaknesses in my life. One of them is, and we've joked about it before, my ineptitude at mechanical things. Uh, I shared this story on Wednesday night, months and months and months ago. Scott came to my house. Now, we're going to do, we did this on Wednesday, but you guys are Sunday people. We're going to take a test. We're going to take a test, Scott. Are you ready to take this test? All right, wake back up. All right. Scott came over to my house to do something electrical-minded, okay? Uh, we don't need a seven-minute speech to explain what you were doing here, all right? <laughs> but there was something above my water heater that I didn't need. Like, is the word a transfer case? Switch. A transfer switch. All right. A, a and Scott said, you don't need that. So Scott came over to my house to fix whatever this was. Now, this is what the man said to me. He looks over at me and he says, do you know where the fuse or do you know where the breaker is? And I said, yes. I walked into the garage and I looked at the breaker and I found out which one it was. And then I walked back. So in Scott's world, I'd left the scene and I'd come back. And I said, yes, I know where the breaker is. Scott did not say to me, turn off the breaker. Scott's words were, do I know where the breaker is? I visualized the breaker. I see it. I opened it up. I see exactly which one it is. Yes, Chris knows. Which breaker this is? Chris has succeeded. Then Scott takes a metal screwdriver and begins tinkering in there. And I remember saying, I said, Scott, should I turn it off? And Scott's got the metal. <laughs> you didn't turn it off? I said, you didn't tell me to turn it off, man. So he just backs up. Yes. I would like you to go turn off the electrical breaker, please. Yes, Scott. Okay, got it, got it, Scott, got it. <laughs> That's just an example of the level of ineptitude that I have with these kinds of things. My wife gets e eternally frustrated with me because of this kind of thing. Women are actually usually very good at this, and apparently so are electricians. Uh, they can think a step ahead. I don't think steps ahead. Uh, you know, like, like, for example, I'll say to my wife, this, this has nothing to do with the sermon, it's just funny. I'll say, do you know where the vase is? My wife will get up and get the vase. And I'll say, I didn't ask you to get it. And she goes, oh, yes, you did. <laughs> Actually, no, I didn't. I, I asked you, do you know where the vase is? I was willing to get the vase. I just didn't know where it was. So women are very good at, like, the third step of the process, right? So my wife does the same thing to me. She'll come downstairs and she'll say, we're all out of toilet paper. And I'll say, Okay. You didn't ask me for anything. You made a sentence. You made a statement. All you said is we're out of toilet paper. Got it. I got paper towel. We'll be fine. Apparently, what she was saying was get your butt up and go to the store and get toilet paper. And then so I'll say to my wife, I'll say, you can say please to five-year-olds. Why can't you frame a question with a question mark to me? I don't even understand this. And her response is, you should know what I'm saying, but I don't know what you're saying. <laughs> Ask me a question. End it with a question mark. This is not hard. If you want me to do a thing, ask me to do it. Anyway, we're going to counseling. So, uh, <laughs> I'm kidding. No counselor can handle us. <laughs> I just tell my wife, his grace is sufficient for you. All right. <laughs> 
My point in all those stories was, obviously, I'm a weak man. I have a lot of weaknesses. Uh, and the reason, uh, we all, yeah, uh, we have a lot of weaknesses. And what it does is it constantly shows me how dependent I am. That's what it shows me. Honestly, legitimately, how dependent I am. This weekend was a great example. People love the church because we're a family. Uh, so much work had to be put in. So many servers had to be put in. So many people had to set up the caroling. So many people had to set up uh, the cookies and the cider. My goodness, those women that, that put on the, the play, uh, all the stagehands, all these things have to take place. All the volunteers have, nothing happens unless everybody works together to do it. Does that make sense? Nothing happens. So I am completely, I am reminded constantly how dependent I am on God and on other people. The response to that is humility. I'm humbled. And that's what God is doing in all of our lives. And he's saying, my grace is sufficient for you. What does that mean? I'll tell you what it means. Jesus came to be a savior. You know the Christmas story. The angel said unto them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a savior, which is Christ the Lord. Why did God come? Because we needed saving. And the proud man doesn't think he needs saving. The proud man thinks that because if he gives enough money, because he prays enough, because he reads enough, because he's good enough, he honestly thinks that he has somehow achieved. It is only the humble man that recognizes that he is a sinner in the hands of an angry God, but this God loves him and sent his son Jesus Christ to live the life he could not live, to die the death that he deserved, to rise again, to defeat our final enemy, death. No matter how rich you are, no matter how strong you are, black, white, rich, poor, male, female, old, young, you cannot escape death. None of them have done it. So we needed somebody to defeat our final enemy, death itself. That someone is Jesus. But we can't take advantage of this until we've humbled ourselves and admitted we need a Savior. And you can't admit, you can't look up if you're so busy looking at yourself. And so for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, whom we all need. And his grace has given us the promise of heaven, the privilege of prayer. God is our father. Jesus is our brother. The Holy Spirit is our tutor and our guide. We have Jesus. We have eternity. Therefore, we have it all. Amen. God is good all the time. Father, we thank you. You are a good, a holy, and awesome, and a gracious God. Thank you for being our Savior and our Lord. Help us to be humble as you work through us in your precious name. Amen.